Welcome to the AKT Crash Course in Cardiology. Today, we're going to cover some of the most salient bits of cardiology in this short video to provide a foundation and structure for you to gain the most marks available in the cardiology questions in the AKT. Remember, cardiology forms a component of the medicine questions in the AKT, so you would definitely have a handful in there. Before we crack on, we're going to cover the following. Hypertension, heart failure, chest pain and angina, secondary prevention, statins, and Q-risk. So, let's dive straight in. Hypertension. NICE introduced guidance in 2011 to update the necessity of ambulatory and home blood pressure monitoring. This is to combat a phenomenon of white coat syndrome, where the systolic BP is often 20 millimeters of mercury higher than that of a relaxed state. I'll explain why this is important later. Stage one hypertension is defined as one of the clinic BPs of over 140 over 90 or an ambulatory or home blood pressure monitor of over 135 over 85. Stage 2 is defined as over 160 over 100 or 150 over 95 in an ambulatory setting. And stage 3 is defined as a clinic systolic over 180 or a diastolic over 110. NICE recommend taking blood pressure from both arms to ensure there's not a pathological cause involved and subsequently you recommend ambulatory blood pressure monitoring for anyone with a blood pressure over 140 over 90 but not in stage 2. Ambulatory BPs should be taking at least two measurements per hour during normal waking hours. If unsuitable for whatever reason then home blood pressure monitoring where BP is taken twice daily in the morning and twice in the evening for at least seven days where the best two values are taken is an alternative. NICE are pretty clear about the indications of treatment with medication being anyone with stage 2 hypertension or stage 1 with end organ damage or diabetes. They recommend anyone with stage 1 hypertension to be advised RE lifestyle changes, which we'll come on to. Regarding the treatment aspect of hypertension, it's an algorithm based on letters. Let's try and simplify this as much as possible. Lifestyle advice should be given to all patients, including a low salt diet, reducing caffeine, stopping smoking, reducing alcohol intake, eating a balanced diet, exercising more and losing weight. Fun. If patients are under 55 years old or have a background diabetes or type 2 diabetes, use ACE inhibitors or ARBs if not tolerant to ACE inhibitors. If a patient is above 55 or they're Afro-Caribbean in origin, use calcium channel inhibitors. If that fails and blood pressure targets aren't met, we then do ACE inhibitors plus calcium channel inhibitors or ACE inhibitors plus diuretics, which are usually thiazide-like diuretics, like in dapamide. The next step after that is triple therapy of ACE inhibitors, calcium channel blockers, and diuretics. And step four is the final step in the community, and typically the most common exam question, and depends all upon your potassium. If your potassium is lower than 4.5, initiate spironolactone, which is basically a potassium-sparing diuretic in the class of aldosterone antagonists. If the potassium is higher than 4.5, use a beta blocker. The next step would be to refer to secondary care. So the targets for blood pressure is if one is under 80 years old, a clinic blood pressure of 140 over 90 or an ambulatory average blood pressure over 135 over 85. But if a patient is over 80 to prevent over tight treatment and falls, the clinic blood pressure should be no higher than 150 over 90 and the ambulatory or home blood pressure of 145 over 85. So in summary, there are three separate stages of hypertension and there is a new NICE guidance of ambulatory or home blood pressure monitoring. In terms of treatment, it's ACE inhibitors if you're younger than 55 or diabetic or calcium channel blockers if you're above 55 or Afro-Caribbean. The next step would be to combine ACE inhibitors with calcium channel blockers or ACE inhibitors with diuretics. The third step would be to combine all three and the fourth step depends on your potassium levels and the choice is usually between aldosterone antagonists or beta blockers. And finally, the targets for blood pressure are dependent on age. So if you're younger than 80, the clinic blood pressure is 140 over 90. And if you're over 80, to prevent over tight treatment, we target for 150 over 90. Moving on to heart failure and its community management. First, we need to establish what would be needed for a diagnosis. In 2018, NICE updated their guidance such that anyone with suspected symptoms of heart failure should have an urgent BNP. Of note, this is a hormone produced by the left ventricle in response to strain. NICE actually suggests that a low level, or one less than 100, makes a diagnosis unlikely and alternative differentials should be sought. It's also thought to be a good marker of prognosis, but isn't seen as a good screening tool for asymptomatic patients. 
High levels are defined as that of higher than 400 and raise level is that between 100 and 400. A normal value is considered less than 100. Those with a high BMP need an echo within two weeks or a specialist assessment, whereas raised levels need one in six weeks. You should also be aware of falsely elevated and falsely decreased BMP levels. The most common reasons for a raised BMP include left ventricular failure, ischemia, tachycardia, right ventricular overload, renal failure, and sepsis. And those for a decreased BMP include obesity, diuretics, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, ARBs, and spironolactones. It's worth also being aware of, of the New York Heart Association classes of heart failure, which you might annoyingly be asked specifically about which symptoms fit into which class. So, class 1 is defined as asymptomatic, class 2 is those of mild symptoms with slight limitation in physical activity, class 3 are defined as moderate symptoms with ordinary activity causing fatigue, palpitations or dyspnea, and class 4 is severe symptoms, often usually at rest. So, now for treatment. Like hypertension, this is a relatively straightforward algorithm. Firstly, all patients diagnosed should be referred to cardiac rehab and also have their influenza and pneumococcal vaccines with diuretics like furosemide or bimacinide given for symptomatic relief. Step 1. Upon diagnosis, it is the initiation of beta blockers and ACE inhibitors, although NICE recommends sometimes to start with a small break in between. It's also recommended to check using these after any change in dose to the ACE inhibitors. Angiotensin receptor blockers are also seen as an alternative when ACE inhibitors are not tolerated. Step 2 for treatment is either aldosterone antagonists, ARBs if they're not already used, or hydralazine and nitrates in a combination. NICE in 2012 also recommended the use of evabridine if there is a heart rate of less than 75 beats per minute or an ejection fraction of less than 35%. Step 3 would be a referral to specialist care where consideration of an implantable device, usually cardiac resynchronization therapy, with or without a defibrillator, is indicated depending on the presence of left bundle branch block or QRS elongation. So, to summarise, to diagnose we use a BNP first and then specialist assessment dependent on that result. If it's high, 2 weeks. If it's raised, 6 weeks. We then start treatment on beta blockers and ACE inhibitors and then have a choice between aldosterone antagonists, ARBs, or hydralazine and nitrates, and finally we refer for a device therapy. In addition to this, don't miss out on the vaccines and diuretics, and be aware that there are four different classes for NYHA, class assessment for heart failure. On a bit of a tangent, if you're enjoying this video, please like and comment and subscribe for regular free amazing medical content, it really helps this channel grow. Moving on to chest pain. NICE give clear guidance for chest pain acutely, and with unstable symptoms in the community. If clinically you think your patient is having cardiac sound and chest pain, immediate management of GTN sublingual spray, aspirin 300mg and a transfer to hospital with or without an ECG is indicated. You don't need to give clopidogrel in the community, and oxygen isn't indicated if SATs are okay. If, however, the chest pain was over 12 hours ago, but less than 3 days ago, it's indicated for a same-day emergency assessment. If the pain was for more than three days ago, then a full ECG and an assessment with troponin should be sought before any further decision making. So, let's say that your patient has long-standing cardiac sounding chest pain with typical symptoms. How would you go on to investigate to confirm your diagnosis? NICE recommend first line for all patients CT coronary angiography. If that proves inconclusive, the next step is non-invasive functional imaging such as cardiac MRI or stress echocardiography. Failing that, the last line will be a diagnostic angiography. So now we've established a diagnosis of stable angina. We ought to know how to comfortably manage it. All patients should receive a statin and aspirin in the absence of any contraindications, with PRN GTN sprayed sublingually. Beta blockers or calcium channel inhibitors are first line, but remember, if you're using calcium blockers alone, verapamil or dortiazem should be used. Don't use beta blockers with verapamil because the risk of heart block is still quite high. Titrate those doses until maximum before using any other drugs. The next step would be to combine beta blockers and calcium channel blockers together, remember not heart rate limiting ones, and if that's inappropriate or fails, the choice is between a long acting nitrate, necarandal, renolazine or evabridine. Some patients do have tolerance to nitrates so monitor this. If all medical treatment fails, Surgical intervention with a PCI or coronary artery bypass graft would be warranted. With regards to secondary prevention and myocardial infarcts, 
If a patient has a confirmed MI and subsequently treated, secondary management is often initiated or at least managed by the primary care team. All patients will be in dual antiplatelets, aspirin and clopidogrel, or even ticagrelor, usually for 12 months, as well as beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, and statins. Lifestyle advice is also important here. A Mediterranean diet, exercise of usually 20 to 30 minutes a day, and withholding any sexual activity until at least four weeks after MI. Note, sildenafil and other PDES inhibitors should only be used after six months after myocardial infarct and never prescribed with nicarandil or nitrates. Our final topic is about statins. They work simply by inhibiting the action of HMG-CLA reductase, which reduces cholesterol synthesis. For exams, you need to know about the indications of statins, which include all people with known cardiovascular disease, including CVAs, ischemic heart disease and arterial disease, Anyone with a Q risk score above 10%, this is an online calculation to work out cardiovascular prognosis, and anyone with type 1 diabetes if diagnosed over 10 years ago or if they've established nephropathy. For those of you who aren't clear with Q risk, it's an online calculator that takes into account a number of variables to provide a risk of cardiovascular diseases from happening. You do, however, have to be careful with patients on macrolides as well as statins, and it's a big no-no for pregnant patients. The most common side effects include myalgia and liver impairment, so you need to do a baseline liver function test, one at three months and one at 12 months. And if there is a rise of any LFT three times its baseline, stop the statin. In terms of prescribing, for primary prevention, it's 20 mg once daily, with the dose increasing if there isn't a fall of non-HDL cholesterol of 40%. For secondary prevention, i.e. after an MI or a stroke, it's 80 mg once nightly. So to summarise those last three points, if a patient is in current chest pain, admit them. If the pain is in within 12 hours, they would warrant a same-day assessment, and if it's over 72 hours, do a troponin and ECG before making any further decisions. In terms of investigation, first line is CT angios, then non-invasive mechanisms of investigation, followed by a diagnostic angiogram. Regarding treatment of chest pain, beta blockers plus or minus calcium channel blockers are first line, followed by renolazine, nicarandil, or nitrates. If all else fails, surgical intervention of PCI or coronary artery bypass grafts are indicated. And secondary prevention includes ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and statins. In terms of lipid modification, statins are indicated in anyone with established cardiovascular disease, a Q risk above 10%, or type 1 diabetics of longer than 10 years, or nephropathy. Do LFTs at 0, 3, and 12 months, and depending on whether it's primary or secondary prevention, it's 20 or 80 milligrams nightly. So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this AKT crash course in cardiology. Please like and subscribe and follow the page on Facebook. If there's any specific topics you want covered, let me know in the comments below and I'll try and find a way to help you out. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video.